Welcome back, everybody, to the Birdies and Bourbon Show. We're excited to have Wright Thompson uh, on the show with us today. He just, re well, I shouldn't say just, uh, what, uh, late 2020, you released Pappy Land. Uh, I'm going to enjoy a little of the day while we're talking. So, uh, Wright, thanks so much for coming on. We appreciate it. Oh, man, it's my pleasure. Look, uh, you guys got the coolest offices ever. I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. For, uh, what, th uh, four years almost? I mean, you had a pretty damn cool office getting to follow uh, Julian around, right? Well, that, uh, yeah. I mean, like my, the amount of whiskey I wrote off on my taxes, uh, <laughs> it's pretty astonishing. I mean, I, I, I was really worried. There, there, was, there was a couple of those I was like, I'm definitely going to get a visit. Like, this, is, <laughs> this is too far. We've gone too far. Nice. We're, we're released oh, wait, this all after completely tax legitimate. Day, so. I mean, Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A a April 16th. No, this is, no, like, it's hilarious. I mean, it's all legit, but it's like, there, there was a lot of whiskey consumed. Yeah. So, so for folks that don't know, and, and I, I'm, I'm not sure that anybody listening doesn't know who Wright Thompson is, but, um, uh, still senior writer for ESPN.com and ESPN, the magazine. That, that is correct. And uh, I mean, I, 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 along with a slew of other stuff, but that is the uh, senior writer is the job that keeps the lights on. Yeah. So, so real quick, and I, I know we got you for a short time period, but um, so you, and, and if you haven't read any of right stuff, uh, you, you definitely should. I mean, very interesting take on, you know, your outlook and, and how you approach things and how you kind of get into, uh, the, uh, the story that you're telling, right? I mean, I, I don't necessarily look at things that you're writing and read it as, uh, biographical, which I don't think there's any intent there that it is that, but it's more kind of, uh, how do you capture that moment? And, um, you know, it, this is going to go out on a podcast and we'll release on YouTube at, at a later point, but, you know, I, I am enjoying some Pappy. I'm sure you got to enjoy some for, for some point. I've been, I've definitely, if you haven't listened to Wright's other, uh, he, he's like, he's a social media fiend at this point. I mean, he's on everything that you could get on and, and, and he's everywhere, well, but yeah, go ahead. No, I mean, I, the, it's funny. Instagram is totally addictive. I was, uh, uh, the book people made me do it. And, uh, like I have somebody who does it sort of for me, except that I have it and I go rogue. <laughs> and so like, <laughs> you, you can always tell if a bunch of random pictures show up in my stories, it's cause I'm drunk at home. Oh, this is cool. <laughs> so I, uh, 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 I don't, I don't think anybody likes it when I go rogue. <laughs> Now, but I got the passwords, it's my damn name on it. I can post whatever I want. It's funny. That's exactly what Dan says to me. He's like, damn it, you're drunk. Don't be doing shit like that. It's true. It's true. Uh, so, so Dude, let's, uh, I mean, let, let, yeah. So how, how did you, so, so how do you go from being a sports writer so now you're going to write about whiskey and I don't want the can story. You can give us the can story, but I mean, did, did you ever think you were going to want to write about whiskey and bourbon or is it just, it just fell in your lap? All right. I mean, like real talk, uh, yes. my agent basically made me do it <laughs> uh, and dragged me kicking and screaming because I was like, man, I'm busy. I don't need more shit to do. I also get obsessed with stuff. And so I knew that like, I was gonna get pulled in down the rabbit hole. Uh, and, you know, I, Julian was, and, and Julian's really private and like sort of constantly reluctant. I mean, I, I, bet, I've, I bet I spent four years with him and I bet honestly, I didn't use a single thing from the first 15 months. <laughs> you know, I was writing it all down. I wish I'd have known. I could have just skipped all that stuff. Uh, but it took a long time, one, for me to even figure out what the story was, and two, for him to feel comfortable enough. You know, at the end, I, I just would fire off questions, like crazy personal shit that you're not supposed to ask anybody. You know, like I just would text sure. him out of the blue, do you believe in God? <laughs> you know, like, like just... But yeah, deal with that, Julian. Uh, uh, and so, you know, it, it takes a long time to get to that point. So at the very beginning, my agent was just like, you need to write a book about bourbon. And then the more time I spent around Julian, 
I realized that, you know, I, everything that was going on in his life and my life, while I happened to be going back and forth between Mississippi and Louisville to talk to him, uh, I kept finding that the things that mattered the most to me were the conversations we were having that had nothing to do with Van Winkle or whiskey. And that all of the things those conversations were making me think about in my own life on the drive home. And so I started and stopped and started and stopped and I hated everything I was writing. And I ultimately came to realize the reason I hated it all was because the most emotional and interesting and import, personally important version of the four years I spent going back and forth wasn't going to be the one that lived in the book. It was going to just belong to me. And that sort of felt like an enormous waste. And even more than that, I mean, just for anybody who sort of has pride in their craft, it just felt like a huge failure. Like if I have this profound experience with this person and I can't figure out how to transmit it to readers, I need to be in a different line of work. And so that was really frustrating and scary because I just was like, I don't understand how I said yes to this thing. And now I'm in this full fucking existential crisis over it. And I was angry with everyone involved in it a little bit. Cause I was just like, well, I don't understand how I got here. Uh, yeah. And then one day I just was like, look, I'm not going to write a book about whiskey. I'm going to write a book about writing a book about whiskey. Nice. And I mean, it sounds stupid, but that's, that unlocked it. No, it's great. No, it, it makes perfect sense. And again, I mean, think about, I mean, and so, so you lived it, you, you, you know, for at least for a time period, I mean, not what they lived it for. And, and the best way to figure it out is to go buy the book and read the book and then you'll get the shit that you need to know. Right. I mean, that, that's the best way to dig into it. But I mean, the, the whole, the whole happy experience is it, it's, it's an adventure. I mean, it's an experience. It's not about, uh, Oh shit, you got a bunch of liquor behind the bar, pour me a glass and let me drink it. I mean, there's a whole fucking, process you've got to go through to get a bot number one to find even a bottle that's available number two is it going to be a price point that you're going to want to buy or, or that you could that you want to afford to pay and then number three it's like well shit am i actually going to drink that because i found it and i paid whatever for it and now i'm going to enjoy it and i'm going to and, and i'm going to share it with people or is it, i'm going to just i'm just going to put it up there and it's like well don't fucking touch that because uh you know i mean i think that's the part that uh, if there's any insight there when i get a bottle i'm drinking it uh i mean i open them almost immediately uh, and I don't like, I don't go home and, you know, the, I don't, my 530 cocktail is, I'm not just going to pour myself some, but like I, I go, you know, once I open it, I, any, if you come over to my house, that's what I'm pouring until it's gone. Uh, if it's just me, I got a decanter full of maker's mark, you know? Yeah. Uh, it's funny. I get all these emails. People are like, I want to get a present for my brother's wedding or like, uh, I, I want to get a bottle of whiskey. It's a bachelor party. Or what should I get? And I mean, I'm always like, look, I mean, the allocated stuff, if you get it, it's awesome. Uh, it annoys me as much as it annoys anyone because I want to be able to go in a liquor store and buy my brand. Uh, I just tell people, look, you know, whether they like, depending on if they like weed it or ride, uh, get a really nice crystal decanter with their initials on it and then get a bottle of Maker's Mark or Wild Turkey. Like, you know what I mean? Like, cause you know, it'll be there. Uh, it's good. Uh, you know, my, and you can refill good. it Wild turkey's good. It's not. Yeah. A hundred percent. Uh, so yes, it's hard to get. It is cool. I've never won one of those liquor store lotteries, but dude, I enter those all the time. My local <laughs> liquor store here, I got two of them. We have high cotton and social and I enter every single damn lottery. One day I'm going to win. I sort of thought <laughs> with the book coming out that maybe I would win. Like, and I got to tell you, I didn't. And I got, I got more respect for them because I thought for sure, like, okay, now, now I'm going to win. And nope, did not. 100% did not. So at least you uh, know it's legitimate now. Mac won. And I was just, it's totally legitimate because I thought, well, if this is rigged, I'm going to win. And so, uh, you know, it's sort of like, you know, they have the random masters. They have a media lottery to play the course the Monday after the course. And I always entered and I never won. And then I had this story that ran that uh, got a lot of attention about my dad. And then I won the lottery the next year. So it's like <laughs> the lottery is not random. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's rigged. Nice. Uh, uh, 
uh, I showed up. I don't play golf, by the way. Uh, three oh of the last five. Are you? Courses hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait a minute. National. Wait a minute. But you, but you play. So, so, but you've written about Tiger. I just saw you in the documentary. Oh, yeah. You and you don't play. You don't play golf play. at all. I, I mean, I play like I got a set of clubs. Uh, I play like everybody. You know, I play once a year when somebody drags me out there. Oh, you're and, a drinker, uh, not a golfer. Uh, what's fun? A hundred percent. So, but what's funny is this makes golfers so mad that uh, three of the last five courses I've played are Augusta National, St. Andrews, and Carnoustie. Oh, man. <laughs> Uh, like, you, you, you can't see me you can't see, if you're just listening Florida. to the podcast i'm flipping right off right now because it yeah i mean yeah what a pisser bud no, That's, no, uh, like, i get it I, no, no i get it no i get it like i understand like by the way uh your reaction is totally appropriate i'm like i deserve the reign of hate uh like it, it's totally reasonable uh you know it's funny like i'm like everybody like i was out i did a story years ago at defusky island yeah, and they had those, you know, they, they, had a, they had a really great Nicholas course that was being retaken by nature, and so I wrote about the the, the greenskeeper and the uh, superintendent and yep. the pro. I'm sorry, the pro and the superintendent who were trying to fight to save it. And so I went out and played 16, 17, 18 there a couple of times one afternoon. I was the only person on the course, and I borrowed some clubs. And there were these like uh, king cobra offset irons. Yeah, and yeah, all of a sudden, right, yeah. like, I was great. I couldn't believe it, and like, I was hitting shots. <laughs> you know, like, I was sc my scores had names, not numbers. You know, I was like, I made like bogey par par, which I don't do. <laughs> and so I immediately, the first thing I did when I got home was go to the go to Edwin Watts or whatever that store is in Memphis, and I bought that set of clubs. And then I took them out to the Ole Miss golf course and fucking shanked it all over the place. <laughs> and I was just like, and I don't think I've swung them since. Where I was just like, you know, because I really thought like I've unlocked it. I'm going to yeah. be great at golf. Like I really, like maybe I'm a natural. Maybe I've just watched Tiger Woods so many times that like osmosis, I'm suddenly going to have a great swing. Maybe, and, maybe no, the no, secret, trash, maybe your trash. secret is you just need to take a year off between, uh, between rounds. <laughs> You think that's what it is? I, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, the only I, I thing. My, my favorite thing about Tiger, you know, you talk about the 10,000 hours. And my favorite thing about Tiger that, uh, uh, you know, they didn't talk about in the doc. Uh, Joe Groman, who was the pro out there, I've talked to a bunch. He was in the, all over the doc. Basically, what happened is the U.S. military closed all these bases and so the Seal Beach golf course was connected, I believe, to a naval air station because there's a runway that runs past some sort of whole run of the, of the course. And so basically you have to be a certain rank or retired of a certain rank, active duty or retired of a certain rank to be able to play on a military golf course. And they were closing all these bases. So they had this course. So basically what happened is recreational areas assigned to bases could be transferred to other bases if they were in a certain radius. And that works fine if you're in, you know, Fort Hood or Fort Benning, Georgia, where 22 miles isn't that big a deal. But right. if all of Los Angeles is between you and it, it's sort of a problem. So they connected the golf to the Long Beach Naval Base. So no one on that base could cross over and play and there weren't a lot of retired military people there except earl woods lived 1.1 miles from this golf course <laughs> wow. so tiger woods very often was the only person out there it was like he was a sultan's kid who had a private golf course wow. and like the pro said some days they would just play cross country but they wouldn't play the holes they would play from one corner of the property to the other yeah. or tiger might go out to number five and play number five for 11 straight hours like, so it's interesting. People talk about Tiger and his success and yes, it's genetics and yes, it's Earl, but it's also that he at the most impressionable age of his life had access to what was essentially a private golf club. I mean, there were many, many, many days where he was the only one there. Yeah. 
Yeah, so we spun real quick from Pappy Land to Tiger, but uh, that's where that's where we are. And uh, you can see Pappy and Pappy and Pappy Land by the book. So you you got us on Tiger. I want to ask the question: Do you think Tiger enjoyed playing golf until he realized that he had to play golf? I don't know. I think that's a complicated question. I think that I think that joy didn't really factor in at a certain point. I mean, I think that what was going on was much more complicated than yeah. does he like it? You know, uh, I think, I mean, that's a really good question. You know, I think he liked winning. I think he liked the grind. Well, who I think doesn't he liked like the winning? Cost who doesn't like success? Who doesn't yeah. like those? Uh, but, it, but it's like, but you're, you're a certain age as a kid. And, and that's, hey, this is totally off the cuff. We did not intend for this to go down this road. But to, to your point, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's course. like, but, but in the mind of, uh, in the, mind of the, the amateur or the fan and, and be it, you know, wherever you are in your, in your fan relationship, it's kind of like, well, did you, you know, so, and, and as a kid, you know, I mean, you, and I've listened to you a few times that you grew up on a farm and, you know, there, there's certain things that you kind of have to do. And it's like, well, shit, I don't want to do that. And it's like, no damn it, you're going to, you know, taking out the trash or making your bed or you, you, you know, you progress through depending on what your, your nuclear family does for a living and, and, and what your surroundings are. Well, he was going to play golf. And as a kid, you really, you know, I mean, what kid likes to do, you got two girls now or three, right? I mean, and, and what kid likes to do anything that you tell them that they have to do? Well, none of them do, right? I mean, it's always anti, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the anti. And then you get to the teenage years and it's even probably more like, well, I know more than you do. And then you get to that kind of like, I'm, I'm, I'm a grown up, you know, in your, your, your early twenties ish. And then it's kind of like, okay, I'm going to set you free. And I, I think it's a very interesting thing to look at and, you know, did, did, how, how did that play on him from your findings? Well, I think that if you're going to be Tiger Woods or Michael Jordan or LeBron James, you know, it's not, are you willing to pay the cost? You have to like the cost. I mean, there's a little masochism for people who are really great at this stuff. You have to like the pain of the 11th hour of training. You have to like the fact that you've sacrificed almost every relationship in your life. And, you know, I mean, like, so I guess to answer the question, like, I don't know if he loved golf. I know he loved what it took to be great at it. Yeah. And, uh, and I don't think that that was Earl. I think that that was, I think that is, I, th I think he still does. So you think you think he liked uh, the you think he liked the you know, input and the output, but the in between was just uh, it, it was just a due process. Did I hear that right? I, I think he liked I think he liked the input more than the output. I feel like the output was often a relief. Yeah, I think yeah. he I think he hated being Tiger. Like one of the things that's so interesting to me is that his whole professional life was sculpted by professionals who were going off best practices at the time. The only example they really had was Michael Jordan. And the problem is, is that Michael Jordan is an extreme extrovert and Tiger Woods is an extreme introvert. And somewhere in there, nobody stopped for like five fucking minutes to say, Hey, maybe we shouldn't do what we did for this guy, for this guy, it was just like the money machine was clicking. And that was Earl. That was Tiger. Of course, he was complicit in all of that. It was Phil Knight. I mean, was, like no one did it on purpose. It's not like they're bad people. And in fact, the three of us, if we'd been asked to create a media and marketing strategy for Tiger Woods, would have come up with the very yes. thing they did. Yes. The, the, the problem is, is that it feels like it broke something. Well, so, so, so think, think about this though. Uh, Th think about when Tiger like kind of came into w when he first started and, and you hear, you know, in, and I don't want to get into the documentary because that, that's not a you thing. That's somebody else, but you got Tiger that starts down, you know, and, and, and all of a sudden you see Tiger with Michael, with the MJ, which are great. They're still great friends to this day. You got him running with Barkley, still good friends to this day. And, and I'll, I'll stop at those two. And, sort and I'm, of. It, yeah. Well, okay, but but I'm fans of all three of the individuals, and and I think they're all three very different people, even though uh, they kind. Of
kind of went down a similar path, but I think they've wound up at different, different outcomes and it could be years or whatever, but is, is there a point in time where somebody says, whoa, 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 whoa tiger. <laughs> hey, we, we need, it, it, we may need to steer you in a different direction. Vegas uh, on your, on the, on, on these, it, we may be, we need to go down a different route. I don't think at that point, Jordan said something interesting to me one time that makes sense. Jordan was like, for a while there, everything was coming at us so fast that we weren't really making decisions. Hmm. We were just sort of reacting and hoping we chose right. Yeah. And I think that there's some of that with Tiger. I think that it was going so fast that it's very easy for us. You know, it's very easy for me, for instance, 10 years after the fact to go and connect all the dots. I think it's very, very hard and almost impossible for someone in real time to see the dots. And, uh, you know, I, it's interesting. I think we apply motivation to people's actions. And I think we apply judgment to actions that like, I'm not entirely sure what Mark Steinberg, for instance, his agent was supposed to do. You know, like I, I don't, when you look at it, I'm not entirely sure what anyone could have done except maybe Earl and Earl had no moral authority and was gone. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, and so. Uh, it, well, no, Steinberg you know, says something, really you're, you're fired, not get a new agent. I mean, you, you don't, you, I mean, you're, you're at that point, you're working for the person. You're not, you know, it's just, hey, make sure when, when something, when shit hits the fan, uh, my, totally. all my contracts need to be legitimate. I mean, that, that's, his, that's his role, right? So. Yeah. And, and you know, it, it's, there's only been one of him. So there's no map. For him and for anyone, and uh, yeah, you know, it was interesting to me that that you know the thing I kept thinking about was that his kids had never seen him be Tiger Woods until mm. last year, mm -hmm. and mark mark you know, that. I mean, I think I think he, I think he said, you know, my kids thought I was a YouTube golfer, you know, <laughs> yeah. and it, it, in some ways, I'm just grateful for them because you know after he's gone they will sort of have to deal with the size of the shadow. And it would have been profoundly weird to have this third person in your life, which is the ghost of Tiger Woods past, who you had no real understanding of. It would have made it very weird. And I think the fact that they got to see him be him is a real gift. Uh, for them and, and, you know, when you think about their lives and their futures and their kids, because it's not something, it'd be weird to have never really known your father or for the, you know, the version of your father that everyone else knows to be a utter stranger to you. That would be, that would be a very weird thing. So that, I don't know that when he won, that's the first thing I thought of was, I'm so glad they got to see that. It looks like him surpassing Jack is, a challenge right now like he's maybe not gonna do it it was a lifetime goal he said you know i'll take the the, the surpassing him over 100 wins or whatnot if, if he doesn't achieve that and he does he consider that to be a lifelong failure what do you think he because he's an overachiever what is what is he going after in the post-golf career is it is it um magic johnson is it what, what is he what does he want to do you think for his legacy is i don't think like we'll, something i don't think we'll ever see him again Really? I mean, you know, he, he has two, he has two boats. Uh, he has, uh, you know, his big yacht is named privacy and, uh, uh, he has a little fishing boat, not a little, like 65 foot fishing boat. It just looks a little next to the ship that he has. Yep. Uh, and his, its name is solitude. Uh, I think, I think tiger will fish. I think he'll spear fish. I think he'll deep sea fish. I think he'll scuba dive. Uh, I think he will, uh, you know, by all accounts, uh, he is a really involved father who it's very important to him that his celebrity not be this weird person in his relationship with the kids. And I really think that he checks that at the door. I think if, you know, if, you know, friends of Elon say that that's true, uh, I don't think we'll ever see him again. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that, I think, you know, he'll be very happy to just, you know, fish and hang out on his boat and, uh, and hang yeah, out down to the kids. Bahamas, right? Don't he, he owns like an island or a marina or something in the Bahamas that he'll just go all, and chill out. And all but all, 
Uh, Albany. Yeah, Albany, Albany uh, yeah. down there. It's really nice. There's yeah. some big, big shit out up there. Yeah, yeah. It, it's really cool. I, I mean, I, I love the uh, – I, I mean, I, I like your perspective on it. it I mean, it's not um, – you know, it, it's very transparent and just t- kind of taking a look at, you know, the individuals. And, and again, back to Pappy Land and, and what you did with, uh, with, with Julian and all those folks. And, I, and, and I, I think I know where your true love lies, which is back on the sports side, which, uh, you know, we, we're glad. Uh, thank you for taking us there so we didn't have to take you there. Uh, but, but again, I, you know, I, I think that it's I think it's very, again, transparent in the sense of, you know, how you how you looked at one versus the other. But I think the community is so much different on from the bourbon community to when you start digging into the sports community. I think there's I think it's completely different. And you've got like this tight knit bourbon community that it's probably a little cutthroat in some forms or fashion. But then you get to the sports world and it's just like no holds barred. I mean, it, it's like this is like WW. E, you know, shit, Hulk Hogan style that that's kind of, and maybe I'm wrong, but I mean, that's what I say, but, it, but there's more of it, right? I mean, it, it's just more pronounced. Well, you know, I mean, this just seems like a, I mean, it's, you guys are good at this. This is almost the perfect place to wrap because like <laughs> I, this, I, it is interesting to me that this idea, because Julian for a long time had that distillery uh, that plays out in Lawrenceburg. And he was bottling, he was trying to survive, borrowing money and, uh, you know, trying to find whiskey. And he had all this really old equipment that no one had anymore, that none of the modern places had. And when the shit would break, he could call Jimmy Russell over at Wild Turkey. And they had their, all their guys remembered how to work on all this stuff. Because even though they didn't have it anymore, they still knew how it worked. And so just out of respect for Pappy and for Julian's father, Jimmy Russell would send a crew over there to fix his bottling line. And, uh, you know, you have the families who've done this, who've done it in Kentucky for a very long time are all playing a long game. And, you know, long after America only wants to drink vodka again, they will still be doing this. And, uh, you know, the kids go to the same schools and, you know, they go to the same boarding schools and they all go to Kentucky. And I bet they're all probably in the same damn fraternity. You know what I mean? Like, it's just a very interwoven world. It's an incestual business. uh, I was very privileged. Yeah, it's you know, and I was very privileged to get to sort of poke my toe in it. And I hope that the people who read the book feel like they get to sort of peek into a world that they otherwise would not be able to peek into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Well, right, Thompson. Uh, thanks so much for coming on. I know you got a drop, bud, but uh, we uh, we appreciate we hey, and we'd really like so much. To, we'd really like to have another chat with you if you have anything coming up, or if you have some time to spare, uh, you know, at some other point in time, and it would uh, it'd be great. But uh, right, Thompson. Cheers, sir. Hit me up, man. All right. Hey, this is Wright Thompson. You're listening to Birdies and Bourbon. <laughs>